So like we saw with the Warbler data, we only collected information and did calculations for two visits to go out and visit and count the number of warblers we see. The number of calculations becomes way more complex as n grows from 3 to 4 to 5, etc. And so what we could do is we could list all of those values for the sample mean and then continue to sum over each sample and calculate the probabilities. But what we're really coming to in statistics is something really big. And we call this the central limit theorem. And so this assumes that we have some population with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma. We can take all those possible samples of that size and calculate y bar or the mean for each sample. Mu sub y bar then could be considered the mean of the sampling distribution of those means y bar. Sigma sub y bar is what we call the standard error of the sampling distribution of y bar. That is, if we know the population level standard deviation sigma, we could divide it by square root of n to find the standard error. When we have the sample large enough, the distribution of sample means is really, really close to normal. And it doesn't really matter what shape the population distribution has, as long as a population has some standard deviation associated with it. This is very remarkable. This is to say, as the sample size increases, the distribution of the sample means looks more and more like a normal distribution. To help us with this, we're going to calculate what we call the z-score. You can think about this as the number of standard deviations you are away from the mean is represented by z. And we'll have a z-table to help us to find out what z-scores are based on our data. Here, if we know the sample mean y-bar, we could subtract the mean mu for the population and then divide by sigma sub y bar, or the standard error of y. We'll calculate the z-score in lots of examples. Here's an example showing uh, that as n increases, that sampling distribution of y bar really approaches a normal distribution, no matter what the underlying distribution is. So what you're seeing here on the right are an example of rolling a die, and then we sum all of the rolls, all of those numbers that we get on each roll. And you can see that as the sample size increases from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5, the distribution begins to look like a normal bell-shaped distribution. And so this is an interesting example that even though the uniform distribution applies to rolling a die, that is to say you have a uniform or the same probability of getting any side of the die, when you roll a die, as we continue to look and to do multiple rolls, the distribution of those rolls becomes normal. So this is really the central limit theorem in action. More on the central limit theorem. It really only provides an approximation to some sampling distribution that we're interested in, um, but that's usually good enough for our purposes and how we analyze data. As a general rule in the agriculture and natural resources disciplines, we can apply the central limit theorem when n is greater than or equal to 25. That's just a general rule of thumb. A lot of disciplines have trouble with this because they don't often have enough samples. They don't have at least 25 samples. So you can think about people that work in the medical industry, uh, people that work on new uh, health projects, looking at new drugs, new vaccines. Uh, the number of people is often limited to sometimes in the single digits. And so making the kinds of inference on that is much more difficult if you don't have a large enough sample. 